singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. If you guys enjoy the show, you can help me make it better in one of several ways. You can uh, write a review on iTunes, you can click the like button on YouTube, or you can simply make a donation. As always, I will be the man with the questions. And today, the man with the answers would be Peter Joseph. Peter Joseph is uh, a musician, a filmmaker, and social activist, best known as the man behind the Zeitgeist film trilogy, as well as the founder of the Zeitgeist movement. So, thank you, Peter, for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Nicole. I really pre- appreciate you having me on. Fantastic. I've been looking forward to having you here for a while, so let's see if we can make the best of it. Let's do that. Uh, Peter, I use a lot of adjectives in different words to describe who you are, and I want to ask you to describe yourself in your own words. Who do you think you are? Well, since all language is based on relationships, I would have to answer that by thinking of the most appropriate distinction that would qualify me in the view of others. We always forget that communication is really an extension towards trying to relate to somebody else. I would say I'm a social critic more than anything else. But within that, I'm not just a critic in the sense that I want to call out this or that flaw or this or that corruption or this or that social failure. I also like to pose solutions and think about solutions and in the end, I uh, prefer to be solution-oriented than skeptical. Mm-hmm. So would you qualify yourself as an optimist in the end of the day then? Absolutely. I absolutely. I'm also a realist too. I, I, don't, you know, I'm, I try to really maintain a very steady balance between what is possible, what is feasible within a certain period of time. For example, in the course of this conversation, we'll be talking probably about singularity and all of the very whimsical uh, possibilities for the future, and I think those are all great things to speculate on. But I also think that we have to be realistic about where we are in this, in this time frame in society and about where we should be going and putting our focus in. But yes, I am optimistic, but maybe maybe not as optimistic as some people I talk to who are interested in science and technology as applied to society. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, I also hope that we'd be able to to talk about the singularity. But before that, I want to talk about zeitgeist. Sure. So let me ask you first: What does that zeitgeist mean for those of us who may not be familiar with the term? And why call your first movie the zeitgeist? Zeitgeist is defined, it's a German word, but it's defined a few different ways depending on how you break it down semantically. But really it just means the intellectual spirit of a period, which means the dominant cultural ideologies that are pervasive in a society at any given time. So the whole film series being Zeitgeist I felt was appropriate. Same for the movement, by the way, because it deals with that very fundamental notion of what we as a global species actually believe and why. Mm-hmm. Do I sort of notice some kind of Nietzschean uh, connection there, or am I reading too much in it? Uh, perhaps. I've, I try to be versed on different philosophical, philosophical views, but I don't really associate with any particular ideolo- ideological distinction. I, don't, I really try my best to stay away from identification with any person, and ironically, any group. And as we talk more about the Zeitgeist movement, this is a pass-through entity. I don't ever pitch this as an institution to people. I say, well, this is a train of thought. It's completely emergent. So I, I make that distinction. But no, I wouldn't say Nietzsche was any particular massive influence. But as with anything, everything is serially generated in knowledge. Everything we know has been communicated to us by some medium. So, yes, I'm sure those influences exist somewhere in my, in my brain. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you about the story of how you decided to make the first movie, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the path that led you to that moment, uh, what you were doing before that, and how you decided that you have to do that, or why. Sure, sure. Well, uh, the whole reason I'm sitting in here here in front of you is a consequence of a series of events that could never have been predicted, uh, and certainly were not of any intention based on you know my development years ago. Uh, I grew up as a musician and basically 
graduated from high school, moved to New York City to be a professional musician, went to college there for a while. And during the, during the course of that, having maintained general interest in religion and society, but never to the extent of being an activist or anything like that, something happened to me where I just sort of realized that there were so many flaws in the world. I started to feel particularly narcissistic about my own interests as a musician and, of course, all the things that I was doing to make money. And as, as you all, if anyone listening knows, the core cultural driving factor of our lives is how we gain sustainability for ourselves and our family and society, and that's built entirely around a monetary system. And that really kind of polluted a lot of my life, and I felt it a lot more than I think others did. So I worked in advertising, oddly enough, which I despise to this day. And I also worked in the financial markets as a day trader, and I spent years investigating and learning and trying to gain independence from the financial system by ironically being most intertwined with the most crude of all financial mediums, which is the stock market. So that was my form of escapism during this period of development. And then Zeitgeist, which was a performance piece I did in 2007, emerged as a catharsis. And that's the word I use because I just... Uh, I kind of just broke and said, what am I doing? What, where's the meaning in my life? What is anyone doing? Why, why, do I, why do these people over here have all of this wealth and these people over here have none? All of these fundamental questions that I think that many of us eventually uh, start to ask when we look at the world around us. So what many people don't know is that Zeitgeist, the first film as it is considered, was actually not a film. It was actually a performance piece, and it was never intended to become anything more than a performance piece. Uh, the, the data was well-researched. It was put out. I may have spent a long time putting this thing together, but I never expected to release it, namely because I had no rights clearances, and I wasn't about to get approval uh, for the clearances. But once it hit the Internet, uh, it went viral on its own accord, and I didn't expect that to happen. No one did, but it went very, very viral, and it created an energy. It opened up a conversation in many ways, I think, as other people have put it, regarding the issues that are presented. And then that inspired me to do Zeitgeist Addendum, which, again, I was never intended to do a third of the trilogy. And Zeitgeist Addendum was an attempt to give a train of thought towards solutions. And then from there, an experiment emerged where I said, well, let's see if we can get people behind an actual movement globally. And I threw up at the very end of that film, Please join the movement, the zeitgeistmovement.com. When that happened, though, I didn't really consider it to actually go anywhere. I mean, this, what, everyone thinks everything is deliberate in the unfolding of these types of events, and they're really not. You can't be reductionist in our perspective when it comes to the emergence of, of these types of events. And that's why I go back to my original point. Uh, I have, how I'm sitting in front of you right now with this is very contrary <laughs> to where I was when I started. But today, after all the films are out, and you know, after I'm still continuing, of course, communication projects, and I have a lot of other larger uh, social design projects that I want to get going uh, with, with a, a lot of interaction globally. That's a big thing: is generate interaction within global society rather than just saying stuff. Uh, this is this is the path that's been carved out, and I think those listening to this that also feel these pressures, my recommendation is for you to kind of just let yourself be pushed a little bit to see where you end up and to let yourself be vulnerable to the type of change that is what embodies us anyway. I mean, we are all amalgams and we are all being pushed and forced in certain positions, whether we like it or not, and nothing is ever wrong. Everyone should keep that in mind. There's no such thing as a wrong path because it's going to self-correct one way or another. And I could go on a, another tangent on the course of humanity in that regard as well and how we can look at the suffering of our world as both a very horrible circumstance but also a rite of passage towards what's, what will most probably be in the end a very fortu for, fortuitous uh, a new way of looking at the world, a new level of social organization once we get the education out there and these types of projects under people's belts. So I, that, there's your long answer. <laughs> That kind of reminds me a little bit, I think it was Macbeth, perhaps, where Shakespeare said, there's nothing good nor bad, but, but thinking makes it so. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, so what's your motivation then, and are there any either explicit or implicit goals behind you, your, your sort of path personally, and then uh, the movement? Also? Yes. Well, as a communicator, I'm, I'm not a scientist by any definition of the word in a traditional sense. I'm not a specialist in, at least I, I try not to consider myself a specialist. I try to be as much of a generalist 
or as Buckminster Fuller termed it, a comprehensivist, because that's the great failure of our, our awareness is that we're not thinking broadly enough and everyone gets so rigidly. I mean, that explains why you know, the vast majority of our information technology has gone in the form of applied technology into the military systems. So, you know, to call people in the military well-reasoned scientists <laughs> is a bit of a, an oxymoron, uh, if you want to put it that way. Uh, military intelligence, I think, would be the most hilarious oxymoron if you look at it in the broad view. So, you know... My, I'm a communicator in, in most circumstances, but I'm, you know, I think that my skill set basically, and what I've come to terms with is my skill set is trying to write and produce media that can change people's minds. So that's on one side. That's why I have a new film series and I do a web series and I do writing and I have a lot of other stuff that I intend to keep pushing forward with to educate. But simultaneously, we need actual action. So the movement, one big flagship project that has been talked about in the movement for some time, and we're trying to figure out a way to facilitate it without too much of a financial burden, is a programming uh, project that will be online called the Global Redesign Institute. And this is a very simple yet very powerful way of getting the world to look at the Earth as a system, getting to work at, look at humanity as one species and one family, and realizing that there is an overarching technological generalized principle orientation to all of our economic and social concerns, which has to be approached on the global level through a macroeconomic redesign of all, all topographical regions. Now, what I mean by that is we are going to redesign the surface of the Earth in 3D imagery using API programming and show region by region how efficient how X number of people will be getting the surplus of energy, how X number of people in a certain larger design will only have to work X number of hours a week, and really relay the data of what the world could be on this macro... I use the term macroeconomic, obviously not in a financial sense, but in the larger order structure of society, the infrastructure, the transportation, energy utilization, things of that such... And, of course, that conversation opens up all of the lower-tier technology that, for example, Singularity University, uh, the advents of all the advanced technology using system governance, using, uh, of course, the rapid advancement in energy uh, uh, tools, photovoltaics, and all of the incredible efficiency that's been increasing over the course of the past 100 years. So this is the ultimate, in my mind, the ultimate design revolution concept. It's going to be fairly minimalistic because there's only so far you can go down into that type of zoom. We're not going to go down to the meter. You know, you have to be fairly general. But as it expands, as the programming becomes more advanced, uh, it will get more and more interesting and more and more uh, detailed. And the, to finish that point, it will eventually evolve into conferences. Right now, the Zeitgeist Movement has a, its main intellectual date. It's called Z-Day. And we do this once a year. We'll have our, our, our sixth annual Z-Day, I believe, in Toronto this year. And it's a, it's a lecture type of event where we present, you know, all of the, the basic ideas of the movement, social redesign, technology, and everything else. But eventually that will morph into the Global Redesign Symposium. At least it will either be built in or it will be a separate, a separate event. And this will go region by region to show each region, for example, I'm in Los Angeles, to show everyone in Los Angeles that attends how Los Angeles could look if we wanted to take a ground-up, reasoned, rational systems approach to macroeconomic surface design to facilitate efficient transport energy. Forget the market economy. Forget the free market chaos of trying to piece all this stuff together through property ownership. Let's just show what the world could be if we just applied this fundamental systems governance premise. So that's a very exciting project that we're trying to get underway. It's not an easy one, as you might imagine. Uh, it builds very much upon, just to, to make the association, what Buckminster Fuller did in the, in the 70s called the Buckminster Fuller World Game, where he had a very crude type of uh, educational thing where he took his big map and he laid it out and he had school children mostly decide how to do certain things on the planet to create world peace and create an abundance and all of those things. So this is a high-tech version of that. And uh, I think it's well needed. I'm really, frankly, surprised no one's done it yet. <laughs> you know. Let me ask you. That's fantastic. Actually, before that, you said that the the the, the meeting might be in Toronto. I'm actually located in Toronto, Canada. Oh so yeah. For those who may be interested in attending, what's the? Can you give us the date and the place, perhaps? Oh, this. 
I'm, I'm sorry to say this is still in discussion right now. We're in the organizing stage, but it will exist in March. It'll probably be uh, in mid-March. It's usually around the 13th or 14th during a weekend. Okay. And that's actually great that you're there. Maybe we can have you come. I'll, I'll, we should talk to you about that uh, to sure. see if, if you have any interest in, in speaking. Uh, we, we take – it's not just – you know, we talk about obviously the movement, but it's also bringing in other speakers that have, have unique impressions that – are ultimately interested in social change. Do you take well on some challenging outsiders like me? <laughs> oh, I, I, we, everything challenging is welcome as long as it's respectful. So, you know, <laughs> if, if we all agreed, there'd be no progress. So I, any, I, I, I'm so confident in this very fundamental worldview, this train of thought, that I just wait for challenges for anyone. I, I'm not the kind of person to step back and, and want to dismiss those that have objections. Because if we're all thinking clearly and relatively rationally, we can find solutions for, for the, the objections uh, in this type of systems approach. I very much agree with what you just said, actually, and that's actually one of the reasons, one of the few reasons that I brought you on the show today okay. uh, and why I'm so happy to have you here. So let sure. me ask you this. What did you learn after making three movies that, from what I hear, have had perhaps hundreds of millions of views? <laughs> Well, it, the numbers of views takes a different kind of feel than what a what a commercial success would be. Uh, a lot of people hear that and they they automatically equate that to to some type of public notoriety in the larger world. But it, actually, the Zeitgeist like film series, while it's while it's known, it's still underground. <laughs> it's really not. It's not as many people know of it as much of Zeitgeist as a household name in a lot of respects. Uh, it's still very much a hidden sort of phenomenon. I'm I'm both. I'm both enlightened to say because it gives it a certain a certain integrity, but then simultaneously, uh, I wish that uh, more people in the in the larger echelons of society would kind of get their head around this stuff. It's also had a lot of influence too. So what have I learned? Uh, I've learned that first of all, the new film series I'm going to work on, I'm going to try and make it as big as possible. I don't mean in the sort of sellout manner, but I'm going to take a more traditional route. I'm going to release it, of course, on the internet, but I'm going to do my best to release it in the largest institutions I possibly can, because this series for me is even more important, because uh, it basically builds upon, as you suggested, what I've learned. And what I've learned in most part is that information only goes so far. You have to give people an aesthetic to hold on to when it comes to understanding the world, especially understanding the future and what the future could be. Hmm. They, it's very hard to conceive of the future because we're all so locked into the present. Therefore, there has to be something to show it, to make it make it you know, ethereal, to make it real, to make it visceral, I should say. And that's what this film series is going to try and do. I'm going to build upon... I'm going to build upon a lot of the memes that are existing from from the counterculture revolutions and the mass protests to Anonymous to Occupy to a lot of these institutions that are coming from underneath the surface. And when people watch this film, they're going to see the world as it, is, it exists now, but through a particular filter. And I'm going to relate all of this stuff into a transition into what the future may hold. And the point, and this goes back to what I've learned, is that we have to we have to begin to isolate and di distinct, distinctly quantify the attributes needed for step-by-step -step -step transition into a new sort of a new social model. And I get frustrated because I speak with a lot of people that have so many grandiose ideas, and they're so scattered. You know, it's such a scattered world. The information overload is so dramatic. And I think again, back to what I've learned, it's a matter of reducing. We have to unlearn a lot of things and get to a small point of basic understandings and work from these generalized principles, as they should be called, and then we can facilitate a step-by-step. -step. I hate to use the word revolution, but uh, you know, my entire interest is to see global change on the social level. The greatest technological institution we have, the most important technological institution we have, isn't the computer. It's actually the way we think about society. It's the global program. It's, it's the monetary, economic political, even religious and spiritual associations. It's the zeitgeist, as that term denotes. Mm -hmm. And that's that's my biggest interest in technological uh, design revolution is the social system itself. And I, I'm sorry, go on. Yeah, so it sounds like you want to create sort of the step-by-step -step guide or the roadmap towards creating that social change that you're yes. talking about. That is what is deeply needed. You know, a lot of, again, a lot of great thinkers are out there that have been talking about change, and they can tell you what change is, but we really need a think tank 
to figure out how to get there and how to make a hybrid economy, which I think is the next step, where we, we, we are able to utilize all the beautiful things that are happening in science and technology for the betterment of humanity, but yet we don't have to completely dismiss the current system in order to do so. I'm jumping a little bit ahead here. I'm not sure what your awareness is regarding the dispute that I perpetuate with respect to the incompatibility of the, of the socioeconomic system as it exists today and the incompatibility of that system with this newly understood scientific overlay and scientific awareness that can facilitate incredible change and problem resolution. But I feel they're completely incompatible. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to come back to that a little okay. bit later, but I want to do it step by step so that oh, we please. can build it for our audience who are, may not be familiar with your work okay. per se. So uh, let me ask you this. Uh, what was the most surprising thing, thing that you didn't expect that you discovered in that journey of making three movies like that? Sure. Well, what is, is the fact that the conversation continued and it has morphed and taken a life of its own. I really, I don't, I don't have a big ego with, with my general work. I really am not a filmmaker. I haven't, really wasn't a filmmaker. So when these things came out, it was very intuitive. It's very, I'm not sure the word to describe it. I'm not heavily invested in that type of communication. So the fact that it caught such, it caught flame so quickly and so many people identified with it reinforced something that I never expected, which was the fact that so many people saw the world the same way that I did. So that was a very uh, powerful thing for me to see. It, it created a, a deeper unity for me as well to see that I wasn't alone. And that's a unique email I get very frequently from others in the community that are trying to see, so seek social improvement is that, oh, I really felt I was alone and I felt I was crazy until I saw your film series. And that's a very wonderful email to get. And that mm -hmm. identifies with my, my perspective as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, so... Let me let me ask you the, the flip side of that coin. Then, uh, would you change anything? Say, for example, in the first film that you made, looking back at it now, almost five years ago, six years ago, would you change anything if you could? Well, I made necessary changes in 2010, so I updated that film and removed some temporal things about about points that were date-oriented that no longer would serve the purpose because the date had passed. But I, I get your question, because I think the first film is a fish out of water in a lot of ways with respect to the other films, at least by many's interpretation. But I think it's important, and it's a little bit sophisticated for people to understand when they watch something like this, because everyone thinks in a reductionist way. If everyone's reductionist, they component, they component bracket all the subject matter in the first film, and they, 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 they don't understand how it relates. They don't understand how it evolved through time in an emergent sense, how it's literally synergistic in its development. So no is the answer. Even mm -hmm. though, even though many people still take objection, and in a lot of ways, a lot of the controversy towards the movement, sadly enough, has been propagated by people that are so angry at that first film, that they just equate it to the movement in me, and they dismiss us based on that premise. And it's a, it's a very immature disposition. I don't take it very seriously. But you see this rhetoric all over everything. You see it on Wikipedia. You see it, you see it everywhere. But that is the natural course of events. So nothing is wrong. Everything is working on its own level. If I hadn't done what I did, I wouldn't be in the same position. I wouldn't have attracted the diverse audience that I did. So I think it's important people step back and really look at this as an evolution. And I think when someone begins with that first film, then they get to the second film, then they get to the third film, they are following a very, not only a train of thought intellectually about, about the issues that were raised, they're also following a development of concept of me. You're actually watching me change and alter and mix and emerge in different ways. And that's exactly what I will persist to do. And I don't regret any of it. I entirely agree with, with the fact that uh, it is an evolution. Perhaps a little later I can share with you my thoughts on it. But sure. the more important thing is that I, I'm trying to figure out what exactly do you mean by the word evolution here. Because, you know, I am here doing what I'm doing right now. And part of the evolutionary process that led me here went through many, many mistakes that I would not repeat today if I were to do it over again now because of the things that I learned along the way. So, uh, yes, I had to make those mistakes to be here talking to you today. Mm -hmm. But 
again, if I could go back, I'd probably try to avoid them because now I recognize many of the things that I have done three or four years ago when I started doing this were mistakes. So I'm trying to figure out if you have any personal regrets about things that you think you could have done better, things that you think may be mistakes. Well, of course. I mean, anyone that has any objective view and recognizes recognizes the path of, uh, of constant self-correction that is life would always regret probably a certain number of factors every day of their life. So when it comes to the film series, yeah, I, again, it's a difficult point because I look at it in a less reductionist way. If I didn't make so-called mistakes, so to speak, then there wouldn't have been progress. The first film had a very deep, a deep criticism of religion, for example. Now, that alienated a lot of people in, in my future work as far as the association to my work because if you're religiously minded, which is still a very powerful, uh, powerful philosophical institution on the planet, the, uh, meaning theologically religious, uh, you're, gonna make, you're not going to make many good friends with that. So if I, could, if I could go back to that, I would try to requalify that my criticism towards religion isn't trying to offend anybody. It's to make a very legitimate case intellectually. So, yes, I think there could be improvement across the board with a lot of those issues that were so taboo. So I, I agree with that. You know, I mean, you could, we could talk for hours on things that we feel that we should have done differently, but, again, that's the process. I mean, I could jump to Zeitgeist Addendum, and I could say that the – the, the overarching emphasis in the third section on the Venus Project was over-exuberant. And it was actually misleading in a lot of ways towards the community because it created an identification with an institution. This is something I learned later. I learned that institutions are detrimental across the board. So if you come across anybody, and I have great respect for Jock, but if you come across anybody that has one identification, that's to an institutional association where, say, for example, in the course of this conversation, all I say to you over and over again is, yes, people should learn about the Zeitgeist Movement and become the Zeitgeist Movement. That doesn't give any real information. Mm -hmm. That doesn't. All that does is present an institutional association. And the dangers of that is you end up with guru status associations. I, I watched this experience with Jacques. He had to endure heavy guru status which I would argue is also of his own creation because they take an institutionalized perspective. So if I could go back to Zeitgeist Addendum, I would have rephrased that entire section introducing the Venus Project, and I would have made it about the train of thought. I would have made it what I made it when I made Moving Forward, which was a much more balanced depiction and educational type of activism where you're not just focusing on one particular person or one particular idea. You're trying to give the audience the tools to think to think about the relevant concepts as opposed to saying, go join this institution or go look up this individual. I am rigidly anti-institution and anti-individual. Knowledge and social development is absolutely absent of the human interest, meaning that our forms that we take in our brains are completely irrelevant. We could cease to exist and in a certain sense, knowledge would continue to evolve. Obviously, that's a ridiculous statement because it's our brains that are in this group mind that do that. But knowledge is utterly independent of the human being. And that's the one thing I think that has to be driven forward more than anything else in our society is we need to create thinkers, not followers. The entire po political social system is based upon people following, and that's a, a great disaster. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another, another point. You know... Uh we're jumping a little bit ahead of, of my plan here, but sure, uh, let me throw in a, a, an audience question here sure. uh, from Christopher Jeanette, uh, who says, uh, how has the Zeitgeist movement evolved since the infamous schism with the Venus Project? Where do you want the Zeitgeist movement to be 10 years since its inception? Those are okay. his two questions. Sure. The Zeitgeist movement has, in my view, the Zeitgeist movement gained maturity once the separation of the Venus Project commenced. I think that people look at stuff like that, they say, oh, I wish that didn't happen. But they don't really look at the process, as we talked about a moment ago, of evolution. It's like a tree. Nothing stays the same. Things break off, and everything is ch constantly changing and emerging. We have to accept this fact. And that's, why, again, why institutionalized establishments are a detriment to social development. The schism uh, that he referred to it as was, was of a... Uh, 
of a natural consequence, and I'll leave it at that. I'm, I could say a lot about that because people always ask me about it, but it was a natural consequence. The Zeitgeist Movement has matured to the extent, even though it's been very slow because we're all volunteers in this movement, we, had, we don't take donations and we have no financial support, I basically underwrite all projects that happen on the global scale myself. But it's been incredibly powerful, the people that have come into this, that the, the independence of thought, but yet harnessing of this group identification towards common means and common ends has been absolutely profound. It's unfortunate many people don't see that. Mm -hmm. As far as the second question, where uh, was where would the Zykus be in 10 years? Is that what he's asked? Yeah, since uh, its inception. I, oh, since its inception. I see the movement existing as an overarching umbrella organization pass-through, see-through organization, I can't emphasize that enough, where lots of other, like the Global Redesign Institute I just mentioned, isn't going to be a part of the Zeitgeist Movement per se. It's an underneath it. The Zeitgeist Movement is a worldview. It's a train of thought. You don't have to wear a Zeitgeist Movement t-shirt or, or buy a book or join some club online to be a part of the movement. You have to simply look and accept and understand about what the movement is putting, putting forward with its train of thought towards rationally thinking about social organization and a systems approach and taking into account all of the applications we currently have, recognizing the trends such as the singularity concept and ephemeralization and seeing where we're going. Because I really believe once you plant these seeds, forget the institution, everyone is going to find the fundamentally same conclusion. I'm really confident that once this fundamental education is received, everyone even if they don't know the terms, will find the same conclusion in the end. Because that is the nat natural process of logic and reasoning that exists in our brain, independent of every ideology and philosophy. It's a wiring issue. Let me cut you here just for a second and, and uh, talk about the difference between being a scientist and being a filmmaker. Because, you know, I interviewed Jacques Fresco and I asked him what he thinks about you. And I am paraphrasing here from my interview with him, which is public record, so anyone can go and listen to it. But if I remember off the top of my head, he said something like, Peter Joseph is very well-intentioned, he's a good guy, but he's not a scientist. He's a filmmaker. And that for him, that's a very important distinction, because to do it in reality, in practice, you have to be a scientist the way I get it. You cannot be a filmmaker or you cannot be a philosopher like I am and do that. Well, I, I think, uh, judging by the look on your face, <laughs> I think we both know the nature of, of what that type of statement, how isolated and elitist such a statement is. First of all, Jock's, one of his catchphrases has been, there are no scientists. And I argue the opposite. I say everyone is a scientist, whether they like it or not. Going back to my prior statement, every single individual on this planet uses a form of rational scientific reasoning in certain ways. They might be deeply truncated. Even the most religious people I speak with will try to prove that Jesus existed by numerical calculation and regional association and anecdotal evidence of this and that. Everything that you see in application and the scientific method runs through people's brains at all times. It doesn't mean it's aligned correctly. So I think that Jock in his, in his age, and I, I, again, I have great respect for him, but I don't really listen to him anymore because he has developed a tendency that's incredibly defensive and very offensive in a lot of respects with respect to how dogmatic he's become with his worldview and how deeply egotistical his association with the Venus Project and his work has become. It's not his work. Jock is just as much of a scientist as anyone else that's thinking clearly. And I think anyone that... Anyone you speak with that creates that type of elitist rhetoric, you should, you should watch out for. You should watch out for. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, we're getting to the point where I think we've exhausted that specific topic of our conversation, yes. and I want to move on. Um, let me ask you about this then. Uh, actually, I would read you a quote and sure. see what you, what you think about it. So, uh, an atheist... Uh, by the name of Tim Callahan, wrote an article called The Greatest Story Ever Garbled. And in, in it he says, Perhaps the worst aspect of the greatest story ever told, part one of Peter Joseph's internet film Zeitgeist, is that some of what is, it asserts is true. Unfortunately, this material is liberally and sloppily mixed with material that is only partially true and much that is plainly and simply bogus. And then towards the end of the article, he finishes by saying, Zeitgeist is the Da Vinci Code on steroids. What well, do you want to say to 
to a criticism like this? Well, I would say that the vitriol and the, the bias inherent in those statements is unnecessary for one. Two, I would say anyone listening that wants to see a rebuttal to that can go to my consultant, a well, a well uh, researched, uh, excuse me, a woman who has done incredible research for years called Acharya S., who's written novels on this subject, hundreds of thousands of notable historical sources that relate to everything that's in that film. There's a great uh, ego in this sort of truth world, and I find this a lot with people. They'll, some of the most hateful people I meet are the ones that agree with some of the things that are spoken of, but disagree so vehemently with with other parts. It's interesting how how, they, how diverse the responses are. Listen, anyone that wants to look at the history of, of religion, anyone that wants to look at the, the astro-theolog astrotheological basis, the natural world influence of religious thought, which is extremely obvious, can go and find texts that do this. I strongly recommend people be independent in their thought and not take the extremely biased and slanderous insults of different reviewers, which there's been no, no loss of in my world, and actually go back and read things for themselves. Religious history, if you want to talk about that, is one of the most ambiguous, I will agree, histories, because it's been systematically destroyed. The, you know, the great... The great library of Alexandria, which housed most of the wondrous texts of all the great early scientists and philosophers, a lot of the excuse me, a lot of the frames of reference which the Judeo-Christian Islamic texts were built upon were lost. It's been well noted in that in the dis destruction of that library. Just like they're destroying knowledge to this day for elitist purposes. So we don't have all the information, but I think that if you take a larger logical view of the entire whole of religious development, it's very, 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 very difficult not to break it all down into the fundamental uh, conclusion that's presented at the first in the first section of Zeitgeist. And that, it come in the, and that it's so obvious that it comes from the natural world. We can nitpick about this or that fact, but the overarching issue is so blatantly obvious, I, it blows my mind how people get so upset over the minutia of it. Well, I have to, to share with you that I personally kind of, I'm, I'm another unabashed atheist myself, so I've been very uh, sort of merciless at different points in attacking religion myself. Uh, but uh, I, I kind of do not really, I was not convinced by your astrological argument uh, in, in that per first part of the first movie. The astrotheological basis, or the ast do you mean the astrotheological or the astrological? There's a difference between the two. Which do you mean? The astrological, not the astrotheological. So you, you're referring to the fact that um, a lot of these pagan notions of astrology, you don't feel that they made their way into the Judeo-Christian Islamic Oh, they, they absolutely did, but, uh, well, the... I think we're going to go too deep into details here, but uh, That's okay. the, the parts where, you know, Jesus, the Jesus story basically was found any, everywhere from ancient Egypt to ancient Greece to ancient uh, India to, I don't know, Babylon, etc. Uh, you know, I, I've studied uh, a little bit of ancient Greek uh, history and mythology, especially ever since I was a kid. And especially with the, with the Greek references, I have tons of very, very serious problems. I'm not an expert on, on uh, Indian uh, stuff. I have done a little bit of studies there. I have problems there too. And I have very little knowledge about Egypt, so I can't really say about Osiris, for example, and whether that's true or not. But with Greek uh, uh, references in particular, I had serious issues. Well, I'll state this. I'll state this then. And, and, in general summation, because again, if you want to be you want to be explicitly specific. You're, everyone's in a falter in any type of specifics because of the, the loss of history and the ambiguity of the writings as which they are written by historians and, and all of the, uh, all of the fascinating people that documented these issues. But the early Egyptian philosophy has been proven by Egyptologists to have a deeply cosmic relationship to the association. That is the core driver. Once you understand that and you superimpose the religious notions found in the Judeo-Christian Bible, the, sim the symbology, I should say, the confluence poetically is so ridiculously overlaid. There are so many examples that are obviously lifted. I'm not saying it's a one-to-one -one correlation. I'm not saying they didn't have a great variation in the way they rewrote these stories, but the confluence is, is so outrageously outrageously obvious. And again, I don't want to, as you point out, you have to read and you have to divert. I've read, I've spent 
thousands and thousands of hours probably during the course of, of uh, the emergence of Zeitgeist One, going back and reviewing this information over. I wrote an enormous text with Acharya S. Called the Zeitgeist Movement Companion. Excuse me, the Zeitgeist Movie Companion Guide. It's a 220-page text. The big chunk of that is a complete defense of Part One of Zeitgeist. It, I think it's all very obvious. So, again, it depends on what your sources are and how they relate. And the only way you can decide if what's true or not is to average them together and see what is most dominant. And the astrotheological basis is the most fundamental and most logical explanation that I can think of for the symbology apparent in the Judeo-Christian text. Well, let's. Let, as I said, I'm unconvinced, but let's accept for the sake of the argument that you, you've got it right. The, lead me through the logic of the sequence of parts of that movie, right? Oh, sure. So why start with religion and prove that foundation, the astro-theological -the foundation, and then go into the consequent issues that you go into, and why are they so important to, to go through? Because here's my problem. Personally speaking here, I'm, I'm laying myself, you know, I'm, I'm being straightforward as always uh, with you, as, as I'm always with all my guests. My take on your work is this. The, full, the, full, the first movie, I was probably about 20% in agreement, 80% in disagreement. Okay. Uh, the second movie, I was in about 40% agreement and 60% disagreement with you. Okay. The third movie I was in about 60-70% agreement with and about 30% disagreement with. Okay. So I see that kind of evolution that you're making with your movies. I think they're getting better. I also think that uh, you're sort of getting more focus with more relevant points, but perhaps I'm missing something. So lead well, me through the logic of that first movie and why such a... a construct or structure of the argument is helpful towards the goals that you're setting for yourself? The very first section deals with the mythology of philosophy and the dis displacement of truth and the fundamental earthly association of humanity and of, to, to the earth, I should say, and of course, this vast powerful political system known as religion that has oppressed society for thousands of years. You see, the first part of Zeitgeist 1 isn't an atheistic argument at all. It's actually a historical document to show how much people have been misled uh, in general in the mythology that has become normality. And across all of society, mythology has become normality. Uh, I'll jump to the third section before I approach the second because that's the deepest mirror the monetary economy and the entire political construct, the notion of wars, 99% of what people believe on this planet regarding those issues, maybe it's a little better today, I'll say 95% of what people believe is absolutely dead wrong. People's association of what's actually going on in the world is so backwards and twisted and so heavily influenced by propaganda. Zeitgeist 1 was an attempt to shake and break those, those associations. Now, getting into more specific terms, the middle section on 9-11 was a specific focal point, a specific instance of mythology that was both religious in its orientation and, of course, socio-political economic in its outcome. So if you remember from Zeitgeist 1, uh, the very first section, the very... The segue into part two, which is the 9-11 section, All the World is a Stage, has a speaker who's actually religious who talks about myth and the power of myth and how it becomes a sanctimonious uh, reality after a certain point when so many people have such a powerful emotional identification with a specific idea. Mm -hmm. and, and while I don't consider 9-11 to be a true issue anymore in the sense I don't pursue it, I do very much question what was given forward by the U.S. government, which has been widely accepted internationally as being completely false. The U.S. pocket and all the mythology in the United States, yeah, people still tote this line, even though you'll get a pretty much a 25 to 30 percent uh, statistical poll of people that don't believe what the government said. Outside the U.S., the statistical poll is off the chart. So this is important because it's mythology in the common sense, right in front of you, religious nonsense put forward right in shock and awe in the form of a social manipulation act that led into a what has been numerous imperial wars, I uh, can count off at least 10 of them since 9-11. That is mythology once again. So to answer your question, the entire film is based on social mythology on different degrees. 
lower and higher degrees. And at the end of the day, it's an anti-war film. It's an anti-division film. It's saying religion is a cause of conflict and division. 9-11 is this huge catalyst that's been pulled over the eyes of the whole world to make a, a new imperial move on behalf of the United States. And then the entire economic, social, political construct is one massive scam, ultimately. Consequentially, and necessarily, by the way, I don't relate this to conspiracy, this is a natural outgrowth of the type of social model that we perpetuate in 4,000 years. So I don't blame anybody. I don't say this political institution is at fault. There's a reason why there's been an empire throughout all of human existence. It just keeps shifting. And when the United States fails, China will most likely pick up the empire status once again. These are patterns. These are social patterns that have a system result. And that is the big argument that I put forward overall is that we have to break this system or it's going to destroy us. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I could go on a larger tangent on the relevance of this, the logic that moves forward, but I think if you really look at it, it's about breaking these mythological systems that are keeping humanity in a very detrimental place and will ultimately lead to our demise if we don't shake them. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that, but I don't want to go too, too much in detail here because uh, I want to leave openness to my audience to make up their mind for themselves, despite of my opinion, because I am liable to making mistakes too. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, so I'd rather set up the environment in which we can all grow. So um, right. I, I appreciate that kind of a reply that you gave. Now, sure. uh, let me ask you this. Have we not made any progress for the last, I don't know, several thousand years, in your opinion? Well, of course. Of course we've made progress. The question is, how do you define progress? Is let progress... me give you an example, right? Okay. Several uh, examples. So... Uh, if you read uh, Steven Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, he says that today we have 500 times less chance of dying violent death than, say, our ancestors just 100 years ago. Sure. One example. Another example is that today a child born in a first world country is likely to live in their 90s at the very least. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So we have life expectancy and we have 500 times less chance of dying a violent death. So that's, for example, for me, the way that I measure progress. Two okay. examples, just. Well, let's think about what that really means. If you argue that life expectancy or a specific categorization of violence not occurring is progress, then that's one definition. I wouldn't argue that at all. I look at things based on quality of life and based on balance and sustainability as a form of progress. Progress is not technological development. It's not even an increase in public health in the sense of those of those fundamental distinctions. Like go back, you know, a couple centuries when the lifespan of an average person was 30 years. We look back on that, we say, well, that's horrible. That's just that must just have been terrible. But then again, we might go into the future, as you well know, and we might be able to live to 100 to 200 years. Is that progress? What if we lived to 100 to 200 years and had limited violence, but yet everyone is as neurotic and as detached and as broken as they are now. And everyone is completely desensitized from the world around them. We have the individualistic neuroses. We have no sustainability. Imagine a, a dystopic view, which is very, very feasible, where people might have these, uh, these amazing technological capacities and AI, but yet the social system is still the same it's ever been for thousands of years. So I, I appreciate Pinker's analysis. And I appreciate those that look at technological development as a form of resolving problems and, and assuming progress. But you have to step back and look at this from a, a balance and sustainability, a systems recognition standpoint. See, I don't really care about the technological tools that we have at our disposal unless they have a legitimate role in creating equitable distribution, hence cultural sustainability, coupled with the acknowledgement of the natural dynamic, dynamic equilibrium and balance protocols inherent to the natural world that we live in. Those are the two fundamental issues. Real success will not be driven by greater and greater technological advancement or greater and greater reductions in certain forms of violence or greater lifespans or any of the materialistic notions that we've put forward. Real success will be when we finally realize exactly what we're a part of in the natural world and gain complete alignment with that. So that's the distinction I would make. Let me, let me ask you about the natural world, though, because in the natural world, you know, we observe a situation of survival of the fittest. We observe what Thomas Hobbes called the, the merry state of nature. We observe a dog-eats-dog -dog world. 
we observe infanticide, we observe, you know, lots of violent death and suffering. So when you tell me about being in sync with the natural world, you know, I myself, the only organization that I've been a, a member in, I have, and I probably shouldn't say that, but the only organization that I've ever been a member of in my life was Greenpeace. And I was paying my dues for about seven or eight years. I stopped about five years ago, which is a whole other story. But in, in other words, I care very much about nature. But uh, I realized that the way I am right now, I would not be able to survive in it for very long for a number of reasons. <coughs> and, and I don't like to see the world being based on the so-called natural laws. Actually, those same natural laws are the one the laws pushed by social Darwinists like Herbert Spencer and the, the, the ideology of survival of the fittest. What you bring up is what's called the naturalist fallacy. This is a long-standing uh, pattern where the, even going back to early racism, there were early notions. Of, there was even a Nobel Prize winning uh, a scientist who had these absolutely distorted views of African Americans and had all these, it basically related them to monkeys in the wild and their association. So the, the naturalist fallacy you point out is not what I'm pointing out at all. Yes, we can look at the, the, the horrors that are possible in a world based on scarcity. We can look at our evolution from a very early primate, uh, very aggressive primate origin where, yes, these types of violent acts are there because there's no intelligence otherwise. I look at things not from a reductionist standpoint but from a trend standpoint and the, again the emergent standpoint and when you take that angle you see the potential for using our brains to reach a new level of comprehension of society I completely agree that it's utterly natural for somebody to be pushed into a corner and being lost of resources and begin to act very very violently in society just by the way like we're seeing all over the world right now everything is natural again nothing is wrong but we can take control of it what we do see in this natural association are certain things that we did not recognize before. I'll go back to my economic point. We have a whole system based on growth, detachment, competition, which at a certain point of time would have seemed natural and would have been necessary. I would relate that back to the early handicraft industry of the post-mercantilist period. That was about the end of when the market economy, about the age of Adam Smith, when the market economy really was fruitful. But it's utterly and completely decoupled, and it's like putting a square peg in a round hole when it comes to the way the natural order and on that finite planet actually works, when it comes to the nature of cultural sustainability. When I say cultural sustainability, I relate that directly into social sustainability, which I directly relate to environmental sustainability because they're actually one big thing. If you create massive imbalance, speaking of the natural law world, and you create people that have a whole lot of stuff that have a whole lot of positive ego, that have a whole lot of success association, and you contrast them with another group of people that don't have any of that, you're going to get conflict. You're going to get conflict one way or another. And you've always had that. Every revolution that's ever occurred throughout a whole of human society is I agree based. with that. I agree so, with that. But my point is that you are also creating something which you call system theory approach towards a global dynamic equilibrium, mm -hmm. which in a sense, right, it would be run by computers, et cetera, et cetera, with sort of a, a smart idea about, uh, you know, product, production and things like that, resource-based economy. But, but my point is that that's also not natural in some ways. It's in some ways as artificially created as, as the capitalist economy that you're replacing. No, no. Yeah, I'll give you an example of why that's wrong. One, I'll just use the concept of growth and consumption. Uh, in this system, the reward for more processing and consumption is more income, therefore the betterment of some group. It is advantageous in our society right now on the financial system, in the financial system, to generate and to, excuse me, to consume as much as possible. That is in stark contrast to a natural law-based, resource-based economy that says we can't do that we have to monitor equilibrium, and we have to adjust our values, our economic and social system for it. So there's your contrast. One is much more amiable, natural, and sustainable than the other, as we've seen around the world. I and agree, you build, I agree you, with that in theory, but, but how do we monitor and adjust that in practice? My concern is because I grew up in communism, uh, allegedly, right. and, and you know, it's one thing to say, oh, daddy, I want ice cream. And there's no ice cream anywhere to say to to, buy, to be bought because somebody somewhere far away decided that we don't need ice cream right now. We need tanks. 
right? right? Because we were Bulgarians, so we needed to have tanks, not ice cream. But when I was five years old, I couldn't care less about tank. I, I cared about ice cream. Right. So well, my concern is, aren't you removing again that decision from people, mm-hmm. giving it into the hands of a computer or some kind of statistical device calculator, you call it in your last movie, I think a complex calculator, but in a way. Well, okay, that's, a, that's an excellent question. First of all, the best way to think about this is not in the form of a scientific technocracy where a bunch of people are sitting around making decisions. And the idea of the computer has been deeply misunderstood, and it's become a sci-fi thing with a lot of critics. They, oh, it's just a system run by a computer. No, it's a system where people understand things like what I just explained, the dynamic equilibrium. You can easily calculate the current uh, mass of all the rainforests and lumber sources in the world, put them into a system, look at natural regeneration, look at how far we can go. This is a fundamental calculation premise for sustainability. All we're doing is extending that outward to include every notable resource and every notable process we can think of. Completely objective. It's not an issue of someone saying we can't do this and can't do that. If, there's is, if there is something that's going to make that decision, it would be the sustainability program, if you will. Now, people say to me all the time, they say, well, who's in a program this computer? Like, well, Science and these fundamental laws of sustainability program this computer. The decisions have already been made. That's another one that's a funny one to say. Who's going to make the decisions? The decisions have already been made. It's a a matter of us to decide. Now, back to your point about choice, and this is a great criticism. People say, well, where's our choice? Because they're so used to this monetary-driven illusion of choice where you have that power because of the money in your hand. What if you had a system where that type of power was also available but without money? It was actually a true democracy of orientation balanced against this constitution of the natural law programming system. So no one can go out there and decide at a whim just because they want to to knock down every single tree in the rainforest. Why? Because we all need that. That would be against fundamental programming for sustainability. So I I always try to – it's very difficult to talk about because people are so foreign to this concept of calculation of society – if you look at an airplane or you look at anything, like, you know, as, as you're working singularity, you know that in the future design will be automated. AI systems are already around the corner. We already have architectural programs that can allow an individual to design anything, pretty much, and the internal intelligence of this design program puts it all together and makes it rational beyond the scope of the individual. This could be one application that the whole of society can be used, used for the creation of anything that is needed within the bounds of natural law sustainability. Does that make sense? That that does make sense. Uh, and again, in principle, I very much agree with 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 what you're saying. I just want to figure out for myself the specific means. That's why, in a way, before uh, in the beginning, when you said that you're doing a roadmap with specific action, I, I also agree with you that that's very important because the devil is in the details. Of course, because that's where you succeed or fail. Right. Well, you're opening a, a can of worms that I could talk for probably 10 hours on. And I, the importance of it is breaking through the, excuse me, the, the communicative problem here. I don't say necessarily with you, but probably many that are listening to this is that they just, people can't conceive of this because they've never been given a natural law frame of reference. They never learned in school about what sustainability means. They never learned how the periodic table emerged. It's been very recent. They don't understand how component parts actually have a legitimate uh, propensity for action. So certain components that we use from plastics to polymers to all of the metallurgy, there are built-in natural laws, systems, if you will, that create propensities for these materials. And yes, you can calculate society. You can calculate, and the amount of freedom, and this is what I want to talk about, the amount of freedom, the real freedom, I don't mean freedom from some oppressive group anymore. I don't mean freedom from uh, a lot of the historical things that have happened. The true de- oppression in society is the labor roles and the hierarchical labor system that is a form of slavery in the world today. Whether it's the third rule being exploited for 50 cents a day, or whether it's your average $60,000 a year dude working in a job that doesn't do anything, so in advertising, for example, like I did, that generates millions and millions of dollars for a very tiny percentage of the corporation. We live in a slavery-driven system that's becoming more and more irrelevant when it comes to what labor even means. So you have probably 70% of the population doing things that aren't even applicable anymore. Mm -hmm. This freedom, if you have a freedom of calculating society and getting balance in society, 
everyone can be free of their hideous slave job that they exist in today. And I think that's the real notion of freedom. And getting away from that oppression, that specialization, and being open and sharing the world in a very legitimate practical way. And again, I could talk a great length about how the, you know, the devil's in the details. Why don't you give me an example of one specific point, and then I can talk about that, because I'll just go on a different tangent if, if you don't. Uh, no, uh, before that, I want to ask you, we're exactly the 60th minute since the beginning of our interview, and I, I know that that's oh. how much we agreed. So, uh, if you want, I can close it down if you're busy, because I know you've, you are very busy. I can close it down with the next two questions, or if you could give me another 10 or 15 minutes, I'd appreciate that too. Yeah, let's, let's, let's stay with this and go for another 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. And, and by the way, I agree entirely with you on, on the specialization issue. And one of my favorite quotes from a previous guest of mine who was quoting a science fiction writer is, specialization is for insects. <laughs> so, That's good. Uh, That's good. Uh, and, and the full quote is actually much, much better than that. Um, let me ask you a couple of uh, top, uh, the relevance of a couple of topics that are more closer to the discussions I usually have uh, for my audience, and that's how is artificial intelligence fit in the whole uh, zeitgeist vision of the future? Artificial intelligence, which is really kind of a, a loaded word these days because of how it's been manipulated by science fiction, is really just a, a, a detached, non-brain-oriented process of computation and digestion of information. And it's very obvious how it would exist. It's, that is the fundamental premise of calculation. No calculation, again, in the context of zeitgeist, of the social system. And again, back to that Global Redesign Institute, and go back to any form of design, in fact, it doesn't matter if it's a computer or a society as a whole, it's a process of thought and calculation and determining certain logical associations based around a given construct. So when you have a computer that's calculating, it, it has a particular uniform <coughs> process, and the movement would utilize that for the, the sustainability approach that I just explained to you. So you want to remove objective decision, excuse me, subjective decision making. The only way that we can comprehend the world around us is through AI because we can't, we can't put enough brains together to, to, to do this anymore. And this is one of the beautiful things about our evolution technology logically is that we have this capacity now. We didn't a long time ago. To sit around and to, for us with all of our biases and our emotional reactions and think about how to navigate, but not to mention with all of our baggage of history, with all the fears that we have. I mean, this is what I get. I run, to, run into all the time. We need an objective system of calculation to meet certain ends. And on the global scale, Global calculation will happen in this means with us interacting with this system. And I think it's a very simple, practical idea. I don't know why people have such a hard time uh, with this. You see this in dentist's office. You see this in mechanics. Mechanics have systems that, that they, you know, as soon as you bring your car into any modern mechanic, they plug it into a system that has the full spec of that car. It can mm -hmm. often isolate problems that are already in existence. So this is a, intelligence is a tool. Artificial intelligence is a tool, and it will be one of the, most life-saving uh, phenomenon that we can put forward. Yeah, because that's my take on it, too. It, the way I understand the whole vision of whether it's the Venus Project or the Zeitgeist Movement, artificial intelligence is a crucial foundational part to make it work. Without yes. it, it cannot, just like mechanization or, or automation of the, the, the production process, right? You're replacing right. human labor with large-scale automation of everything, so that people are free to create out of their own free will and to, uh, to uh, not be enslaved by selling their labor, uh, right. basically. Well, you, we could argue philosophically if artificial intelligence and mechanization are defining attributes of this new societal awareness. We could argue that because in... In I'm theory, not saying they're defining, but they're required. Okay. I, I think they're very necessary. Yeah, and I mean, we, we, we might can't as well, do it without them, right? Well, again, that's, that is a deep philosophical question about what it means to live. Like, for example, if you and I and, say, ten other people went to a little island somewhere. Okay, now, that, so, in yeah. that context, I, I get it. But I, I'm okay. thinking about no, the I context agree. of nine billion people on yes. a planet like ours, right? I'm we, not we, thinking of if we go on a desert island and it's yes. just the two of us, yeah. We, there's, there are not enough brains uh, in the world that could work together <laughs> to uh, do the type of computation necessary at this stage of our evolution, given where we are now and how yeah, complex Yeah, the level of complexity are. required today is just uh, yes. incredible. Uh, now, let me ask you this, though. What's your take on 
the technological singularity in general and on the work of people like Ray Kurzweil, if you're familiar with them in particular? Of course, I, I'm a big fan of Ray Kurzweil. I just wish, you know, obviously singularity as a as a as a as a theoretical postulation where where obviously our computer intelligence exceeds us so greatly that we have to start to adapt to it. I think there's a lot of truth to that, and I think that's already been happening for, for some time. However, I do think it gets a little over-exaggerated, and I think it also misses the social concern attribute. And I, I wish I could sit down with people like Kurzweil and, and talk more at length about really the greatest barrier to this type of development for the good, for good, which is the economic system. I really think that uh, the system works as a deep, viscous molasses against technological development. I don't think that singularity is going to hit when Ray thinks it does, because I think that the actual processes are going to be slowed tremendously by the established commercial institutions for the technology uh, in many different ways. I think the first group the first group on this planet that will realize this will be the military, and no one will know about it. And that's dangerous to me. I think it's extremely dangerous to have this type of a development that is almost working on its own accord within the social model that we have now. And that's my biggest biggest concern. Mm -hmm. They're not com they're not compatible. We are in a, 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 a fast paced race for global maturity. We have to get out of the the weaponry military institutions that are basically ruling this planet as extensions of the corporatocracy, the corporate establishment, because that's what the protectionism really means. That's what the military institutions really represent in this mafia orientation we have. Because if we don't, the level of destruction possible once we continue this rapid advancement of information technology as it spreads to, to, to apply technology, which it's always going to go to the military first. Keep that in mind. It always has and it always will as long as we're in this system. The destruction possible is just off the chart, and that really deeply worries me. So I, I think it's incredible what's happening on one side. I also think it's a great wake-up call and a great call for global maturity and to get people on the same page. So we're not at, at so we can utilize this, utilize the, utilize this stuff for the betterment of everyone, not some select group. I agree with you about the concerns with the military, but yet again we have positive outcomes, like for example the internet. The internet was invented in order to coordinate the Mighty Men. Uh, nuclear missiles by DARPA in the late 60s, oh, sure. and yet it wasn't the military who figured out how to use it and, and adopted it on a wide scale first. It was the public, right? Yes. And, oh, yes. and, and, and so we have a great example of, of how things can arise in the military and yet come out for the benefit of everybody. Yes. And, and so that's one of the examples that keeps me optimistic. Of course, that doesn't guarantee it will happen again, but, but, but we yeah. know at least it happened. So it, 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 it's it, funny you, you, you bring that up because that's a point I made recently in another interview, and that's the fact that the military system, which utilizes more money than most countries in the planet, they are a completely socialist organization, system-oriented. I say socialist in the loosest possible terms. I mean that they don't have a rigid democratic process in the form of equity, moving decision-making process. They actually exist in a microcosm, or I should say a microcosm works, uh, in the type of in the type of ideological and structural organization that society as a whole should be, but without the intention of killing other people. So the military has not only been the source of the Internet in many ways, it's been the source of microwaves, yeah. it's been the source of the stoves. I mean, the Navy was the first to have the home, the whole housing issue. Like All the things we have in our homes originally was built in, technologically thought of by people in the Navy, so they could cook and clean and do everything. So what it really represents, though, is not the military. It represents what true focus can actually do. The military and its organization is brilliant, but its intention is absolutely awful. Mm -hmm. Now, let me go back to the timeline issue here you raised with Ray Kurzweil and, and shift it a little bit and yes. ask you about it like this. Do you agree with me? Uh, so putting aside the, whether Kurzweil has it right or wrong, do you agree with me that this century is likely to be the make or break century for humanity? I, I, it's hard to say, but I, I, I would agree that the amount of change that's on pace is so dramatic that will take so many people by storm that will create so much confusion. I mean, you look at the world right now, and there are at least at least ten or fifteen countries that have massive global pro not global but massive uh, international protests happening right now. We have domestic right on, strife, you mean? Yes, right? exactly. We have yeah. terrible failures, and and in the wake of these terrible fa failures, we have this tremendous progress in the technical sense. Uh, and I, to me, it's just it. it 
it boggles my mind. And I'm, I'm very worried. I agree. I agree that either we come together and begin to look at the world as being capable of housing the whole species. We declare all the natural resources, common heritage, as Jock would say, which is a brilliant notion, also stated by Buckminster Fuller and many before him. We have to come together and realize this, or we're going to get the best of ourselves. And all it takes is one person with some really advanced nanotechnology and some weaponry based on it to wipe out a whole continent in time. So when it comes down to our true sustainability, it has to be a social concern. The individual concern has to be put aside to some effect, at least based on how neurotic it is now. And true personal concern needs to become social concern because we're all at risk. We're all at risk right now. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I completely agree with you. So, so, so you have the goal of bringing everybody to that kind of collectivist social concern uh, in a world where, at least in America, it's, it's not argued. It's pretty much apparent that most of us are pretty much individualistic. Uh, now, even if assuming that's possible to get there, wouldn't that process create a strife or a, a revolution of, uh, on a global scale that in, in its own right would require, I don't know, rivers of blood? Because I don't know, as, I... as one, one of the French revolutionaries put it, revolution is a bloodthirsty monster. Once you let it out, you cannot put it back. I think I think the yeah, I, I understand I understand the evolution. I think the difference now is that the revolution, all the revolutions of the past, have been revolutions that instilled systems that were just ripe for further revolution. So, in other words, we keep replacing the same systems with just variations of the prior system. Uh, right now, I think that the the turmoil and the unrest is so obvious. It's it's so. Uh, it's so viscous, it's so there that the next transformation should move into a much more dramatic place that is unlike anyone, uh, anything the world has ever seen. You have to think beyond and you have to educate people about what the world can be. And if they can understand that, then they will know the direction for themselves. You've got to get rid of the bandwagon associations. We've got to get rid of political ideology. We have to take a scientific perspective of what's possible, how to get there, and how it will benefit the whole of humanity. And will everyone agree? Of course not. But if the vast majority of people that are suffering, which... Was, well, I don't even want to go through the statistics on that, but I think you know them very well. If they were educated enough right now to know what's possible, to know that they live in a world that they live in a circumstance that is utterly unnecessary, and they can organize themselves, it would happen overnight. And the power establishment, the one percent, as it's rightly called by the the Occupy movement, that's a very very small element of the population. And they're not. They really, once the military establishments come to terms with the fact that they are also suffering, just like everyone else, as they. Well, again, that's a big tangent. The military might be a respected institution in play, but people that are participating in the military are shoved to the side just like any other degenerate. Uh, one in four homeless in America are prior veterans. All of this stuff paints the picture of a massive movement, massive movement towards new, broad social change if everyone can see the same goal. And that's what the Zeitgeist Movement is trying to put forward. So it's you nothing. do believe that we can? it can happen in a more or less peaceful process? I do. I mean, I, I do believe that holistic. I don't believe it's going to have to be war-oriented. I really don't believe that. I think that a Martin Luther King type of civil disobedience that says, okay, we're not going to show up for work today. We're not going to do this. We're going to go on strike for this until we see this, this, and this. And once the train of thought emerges based on the fact that all the things that are possible from solving poverty, from creating energy abundance, and all the things, again, that you're very familiar with, once they're understood the powers that be will have no no uh, no recourse anymore but to to cave to these fundamental human interests and i think it will serve them in in the end as well i think they will live better and everyone will be much better off now this isn't utopia i'm not saying that this is the end of all human development this is just the next step where we start to share our resources in a very liberal way and to share our technology and create an open source world absent of the uh, property and neuroses and the and all of the wealth uh, things that have become so normal, which they're not really normal. They're completely impractical and they're unsustainable as value systems. Peter, I only have about four minutes left of the generous extra 15 minutes that you granted me, so I have the last two questions here. Sure. And even though I'd like to talk to you for at least another hour and a half, uh, but I value your time. So let me ask you first this. Where can people find more about you and your work? What's the best place? 
Well, I, I really don't associate my work as much as I do this overarching issue with the movement. But obviously, I have my film work. Uh, you can go to zeitgeistmovie.com, which anyone can see my films for free. I have a general bio, biography page called uh, peterjoseph.info. I also have a number of other auxiliary pages. But when it comes to the subject matter we're talking about, I don't care about my own interest with this. I really just want to see people come in and look at the Zeitgeist Movements material. We have a big orientation that's in development that will be completed in a number of weeks. A big text is being produced that will be the definitive Zeitgeist Movement uh, orientation. And so the zeitgeistmovement.com is where people should go. And you'll get a, there's a whole web ring, of course. There's about 15 different websites. I should mention, by the way, if anyone watching this or listening is in Los Angeles, next weekend on Sunday, I'm doing a media festival. We have a big Zeitgeist Media Festival, which is an arts and science and communications festival we do here in Los Angeles. It's the third annual one, just like we have Zeitgeist Day, which is a heavy intellectual event. Give us we the also- date because I'll, I'll publish this in a couple of days. That'd be great. It's August 4th okay. in, in Hollywood, California. And I will be there uh, talking and also performing along with many other people from around the world. So that should be, it's, again, it's an attempt to inspire people and show the, the world what's possible. Mm-hmm. So, Peter, we've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, and I feel like I didn't approach perhaps our conversation in the best way possible, so perhaps I might use that as an excuse for the future to get you again on my show. Absolutely. But the very last question that I always ask of my guests is always the same, and that is, what do you want for people to take away from this conversation with you after 75 minutes? What is the most important thing, the one thing that you care the most to send out there? That we are all subjected to the exact same environment, the exact same natural law system that we are emergent, emergently discovering, and that we are all sharing the same basic values and interests if we want to maintain. We need to share the same values and interests if we want to maintain basic sustainability on this planet and continue progress, which to me means cultural and social and ecological balance. So we're all on the same page. We're all in the same sea of of natural law dynamics. And until we recognize that, we've got a very difficult road ahead of us. Peter Joseph, thank you very much for spending so much time with us today. Thank you very much, Nicole. I appreciate it.